Take your sword, turn to Revelation chapter 19. Glad you're here today, glad to have you today, glad you're a part of our worship today. Um, we've been talking the last several weeks uh, about uh, the church. Um, if you're a part of the church, say amen. amen. Um, it's good to be a part of the church, right? Amen. It's good to be a part of the bride of Christ, and that's what we've been talking about. Uh, we talked about uh, last week where we begin talking in Revelation chapter 19. We're going to be there again today. I'm getting all my ducks in a row here. I got a lot of uh, stuff here to look at here. Um, Revelation 19, we're going to be looking at verses 6, uh, 6 through 9. So when you get there, if you'll stand to your feet, we'll read from God's Word. Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9. And the word says, Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 9, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as a sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Verse 9, then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. Let's pray. Father, we just rejoice again as we have this time together. God, would you be glorified and magnified and made big. Uh, may your word be uh, Lord, ever clear to us, and may we take it home with us, Lord. May it become the engrafted word, God, that just challenges us and changes us. May it wash us as we've been talking about, uh, Lord, as we prepare to be your bride, your church. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Be seated. So we've been talking about this, uh, this topic these last couple of weeks. This is the third week, uh, Runaway Bride. And as I told you about this uh, passage and this story, uh, kind of the thought for me, the, 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 um, the title, I guess, came, came from a movie, of course, the movie Runaway Bride that many of you are familiar with, but really talking about uh, this book that I received from uh, Claude King uh, for pastors as we had our prayer meeting that night here, uh, Return to Me, and we're going to get to that in Malachi chapter 3 at some point, probably next week we'll get there in Malachi chapter 3, but we're going to be looking again at Revelation chapter, chapter 19 verses 6 through 9. We talked about this thought of, of uh, you know, the church, uh, we know the church is the bride of Christ, right? We are, we are uh, in preparation mode, we, are, uh, we talked about the, that uh, Jewish wedding and how uh, we're in that time of preparation where uh, the bridegroom is back and he's preparing the place that he's going to uh, to make for his bride and one day he's going to come back and he's going to get the bride, he's going to fetch the bride uh, and he's going to bring her back to be with him and they're going to be joined uh, and, and uh, you know, married together and they're going to be a family and all those things. So we know that one day in Revelation 19, what we see here in Revelation 19 is the absolute picture of the fact that one day as the bride of Christ, the church who are of the redeemed of all people, amen, uh, is going to uh, one day be joined together with Jesus in heaven. And we're going to spend forever and forever and forever in the place that he has prepared for us, uh, you know, as the bridegroom, okay? So we're talking about that, and last week we really started talking about God's design, God's design uh, for the bride of Christ. And we talked about two things, two things last week. We talked, first of all, about the love story. And we're not going to go back through all of that, but what we established was the fact that Jesus has loved us, his bride, he has loved us even before the world began. He has, he has established his love all the way, the Bible says there in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, uh, before the foundation of the world, before uh, God created man, before God formed the very world itself. 
Jesus has loved us and he has been committed to us ever since that time. He has been willing and ready and, and he knew that it was going to be a part of, of the story for him to come and to give himself for us. So we talked about the love story that happened before the foundation of the world. You know, he went to, we talked about the garden and we talked about the fact that, you know, not only the garden, but then we talked about that he, uh, you know, he went to the cross, you know, Golgotha. We talked about all those things, the manger, uh, you know, the grave, the empty tomb, all those things establishing the fact that Jesus loves the church. And because you and I are part of the church, that means that Jesus loves who? He loves me and he loves you, right? He loves us, amen? He does. So we see the love story. You know, there's always that story about, um, you know, you, you uh, see young couples and they're kind of, you know, uh, googly-eyed towards each other and that kind of stuff. And some of you, we, some of us older folks have forgotten what that's about and everything, right? Uh, I know that's an amen, all right. Uh, you know, we shouldn't, that we should never get over that, but honestly and truthfully, that kind of, you know, that kind of uh, fades, I guess, as we get, you know, more established with one another or whatever. But, you know, that those young couples, they come, and uh, last night, Lana and I, we went to, uh, they had their Christmas uh, their work had their Christmas. We had a went and had a meal with everybody, all the employees, the dentists, and all this kind of stuff and everything. And it was really good and all that kind of stuff. But just to watch the different couples that were there, uh, to see there, and there were some younger couples there and those things, and just to see them and you know, kind of holding hands and you know all that kind of stuff that you know some of us used to do a long time ago. Maybe, maybe we hadn't got over past that. But anyway, the love story. You know how you met and and you know all this kind of stuff where you met the first time and all that your first date, all this kind of stuff and everything like that. You know the love story. But we're talking about the fact that Jesus loves us so much, and we talked about all those things that he did, he has done for us, and the things that he continues to do for us. And then we talked about the love story, and then we talked about the marriage in, Re in Revelation 19 in verse number 7 where it talked about the bridegroom who is the lamb uh, and then the bride who is uh, the wife or the church who is the wife uh, who's going to be the wife of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. So today we want to begin talking about this second point uh, of the message is this, is God's desire, not design, but God's desire for the bride of Christ. God's desire for the bride of Christ. Now I want us to turn over from Revelation 19. We'll come back to that. But I want us to go over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Galatians, Ephesians. Right? Philippians. Here we are. Galatians chapter, or Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. So we're talking about God's desire for the bride of Christ. What, is, what, is God, what does God want for the bride of Christ? What does he want for the church? What does he want for us as his people? And the fact of the matter is there are simply two things that he wants for us in, in truth. And we're going to talk about both those things. Uh, and we find both these things in Ephesians chapter 5. And not, not exclusively there, but we're going to dwell there and we're going to talk about it there. And there's two things that God desires for the bride of Christ. One is he desires her preparation. He desires her preparation. We're going to talk about that. And not only does he desire her preparation, but after her preparation is complete, we, he, talk, he, he desires her presentation. So we're going to talk about both those things, okay? Ephesians chapter 5, look at verse 25. We're talking about her preparation, her preparation. Now, again, uh, some of you ladies and maybe moms, I remember when uh, my girls uh, were getting married, uh, there was a lot of preparation, a lot of planning, a lot of, of uh, you know, trips to the uh, wedding dress shop and, and, you know, different stuff like that, a lot of conversations, a lot of talk, which I really did not want to get involved in, to be honest with you, uh, you know, not... That, that's just not who I am or what I wanted to be. I, I really wrote checks, okay? That's probably what was more of the, you know, anything else. That was more my role, okay? Uh, but we're talking about God's desire for the bride of Christ and really talking about point, her preparation or the church's preparation or the bride's preparation. In Ephesians 5, verse 25 and 26, look at that passage. Verse 25 of Ephesians says, 
uh, Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave, them, gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now we're going to talk about this, and we're talking about, again about those two things, about God's desire for the bride of Christ. First of all, again, her preparation. Now, the first thing we see in this passage is, is uh, and the first sub-point under her preparation is this, that this preparation is founded in the love of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Founded in the love of the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. Listen, it is not possible for you and for me to live uh, perfect and holy and right before God, right? We cannot do it on our own. It is not possible for you and I as human beings to live and to be able to go to heaven because we've been good enough, right? It's not possible. We, we are, uh, the Bible is very plain that we, none, are, none are righteous, no, not one. All of us are sinners. Every one of us fail and miss the mark. We cannot make it. We cannot do it. Let's just say that first and foremost. We know we can't do it. So what has to happen is, is there's this preparation time. There's this, uh, you know, once we come to know Christ, it doesn't, you know, we're uh, in our standing before God, we become uh, right and righteous because we're standing in Jesus' righteousness, right? Even though we know we fail and we fall short, we miss the mark, we still sin, uh, we don't, hopefully we don't live in sin. We don't, we, you know, we, we can't live in sin. If we're Christians, we don't live in sin. We fall and we sin, but we don't live in sin, um, so we're talking about her preparation, and the first thing, again, is, is her preparation. The church's preparation is founded in the love of the bridegroom. Listen, everything that we have, everything that we receive as God's people, as the church, it is founded in the very love, of the, uh, the very fact that Jesus loves us so much, and he gave himself for us, as it says in that passage. Look at Ephesians 5 again. It says, just as Christ also, what? Love the church. Love the church. Everything Jesus has done is because he loves us. Everything he does for you and for me is because he loves me. You know, things that I do for my wife, I do it because I love her. You know, again, I, I, I talked a little bit about last week about, you know, going to the mall. It's not, you know, I'm, listen, I'm living with, with uh, four women in my house, and they all like to go to the mall and go shopping. Uh, you know, and I like to go shopping. I like to go get what I want, and then I want to go back home, okay, immediately, all right? Anybody understand? Anybody identify with that? That's kind of how we men are. That's not how women work, okay, most of them. Not how my four women worked. They, they like to go, and they like to make a day of it. They like to go, and they'd go in every store that they're in the mall that they wanted to go in, and there was a bunch of them. And I, would find, I might go in a few to start with, and finally I find myself sitting out in the middle of the mall holding bags and all this kind of stuff and waiting on them and hoping that they're going to say it's time to go home or let's go eat. One of the two things, all right? Why do I do that? I do that because that's something that my bride loves to do. And what my bride loves to do, even though it might not be something that's my, you know, my uh, favorite thing to do, I'm going to do it because she loves to do it. Listen, Jesus, our whole uh, time of being on this earth is a time of preparation. It is a time for us uh, to be, get ready to join him in heaven one day and be with him one day and be a part of this marriage supper uh, that's going to happen or this marriage that's going to happen. Listen, the very, her preparation or our preparation as the bride of Christ is founded in the love of the bridegroom. The word there uh, in Ephesians chapter 5 is, um, you know, we might say agape. This is agapeo. Uh, and the thought here is this. Now listen to this. It's interesting. Now we're talking about the love of a bridegroom or a husband who a husband to be uh, for his bride, his bride who he loves. The thought here in this agapeo is this: is to love much, but not only that. Listen to this: but to breathe after, almost like everything about uh, you know. I can remember when Lelan and I started dating, and and 
you know, uh, you kind of started developing these feelings and all this kind of stuff, and you realize that this person is the one that God wants you to be with, and all these things, your desire is to be with her, to see her, you know, to, you know, every time, all the time, you know, all these things, it just, it starts flowing, and, and your whole life begins wrapped around, how can I see this person more? How can I spend more time with this person? How can I show this person how I feel about them? All these things that come with that love. This very thought here in this passage is exactly that thought. To breathe after, to love much. Jesus held nothing back, kept nothing from us. He gave himself fully and all the way, uh, even to death. Our preparation is founded in the love of the bridegroom. There's nothing I can do, but because of his love and what he's done for me, my life can change and I can be a part of the family of God. And one day spend eternity with the bridegroom in heaven. Founded in the love of the bridegroom, Jesus. And not only that, but it says there, uh, again, Ephesians 5, 25, it says, uh, Christ also loved the church and what? And what? Gave himself for her. So it's founded in the love of the bridegroom, Jesus, but it's finished through his sacrifice. It's finished through his sacrifice. It began with the love of Jesus for his church, and then it was finished and finalized as he gave himself on the cross of Calvary for you and for me. That thought gave himself there. Gave means to surrender to, uh, to yield up, to deliver up. Listen, Jesus uh, did, it wasn't nailed to the cross because the Roman soldiers had the power to do that even though they did Jesus he laid himself out there and gave himself for us he yielded himself up nobody took his life he gave his life for you and for me why? because he loved us see our preparation as, a church, as the church as the bride of Christ is founded in the love of the bridegroom it's finished through the sacrifice of the bridegroom he gave himself, he surrendered himself, he yielded up himself, he delivered himself up to be crucified and gave his life for you and for me. And then the third thing under her prepara our preparation or her preparation, the church's preparation is, it was founded in the love of the bridegroom, finished through his sacrifice, and then is facilitated through the word of God. Facilitated through the word of God. Here's how it happens. Here's how preparation happens for us. We read it a few weeks ago again. It says here, again, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. So the goal of preparation for us, uh, what God uh, has, he desires for the bride of Christ is for one day for his son Jesus, the bridegroom, to be joined with the bride, the church. And he wants the church to be clean and pure and holy and ready for that day. You know, we talked about uh, the preparation kind of of a wedding and how uh, the bride is, is, man, they are just, you know, they're just crazy about this, you know, about the ceremony, about the dress, about, you know, how it's supposed to be and what it's supposed to look like and, and how it's going to be present, how everybody's going to see it and how the pictures are going to go and, and everything about it, the reception and the cake and all this stuff and everything. I mean, it's just consuming got to be perfect why on earth would we ever think that if if on this earth that that ladies and and some of us men can get so you know uh crazy psycho about all this stuff why would we ever think that god doesn't want his bride to be the, his son's bride to be perfect and pure and clean and holy and righteous the preparation comes again he says here in verse 26 that he might sanctify. Notice that it says that he might sanctify. Again, it's not, we can't do it. We can't get ourselves pure and clean, but Jesus can, and he has through his blood, right? That's how we get clean. That's how we get purified is through his blood. It says in, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now, those two words there, that he might sanctify and cleanse, Sanctify means to make holy or to purify. The thought is there. So what, again, we're talking about preparation. What's happening is what, what God wants to happen is for us to be, to be made holy, to be pure. 
And then not only that, but it says in cleanse or to make clean or, or again, to purify us or to make us, put us in a position where, you know, when, he, when somebody sees us, it's kind of like, uh, you know, you don't, have, you don't see a bride come out and, man, they, you know, their, their dress is not, you know, all ironed out and, and you know, clean and all this kind of stuff. You don't have stains or anything on it. It's just, it's, it's magnificent. It's, it's supposed to draw attention to that bride because it's her day, right? So in this, when we're thinking about here is we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the preparation that God desires for the bride of Christ, founded in, his, in the love of the bridegroom, finished with his sacrifice, facilitated through the word of God. He said, might sanctify and cleanse it. How? Look what it says. That he might sanctify and cleanse her, make us pure, clean us up with the washing of water. How? By the word. How are you and I ever going to be pure before the Father one day and be able to stand in God's presence alongside Jesus Christ, our, our bridegroom? How are we going to ever make it? Listen, the only way we're going to make it is through preparation. How do we do that? We do it by the Word of God. It's God's gift to us. It's his, it's his love story, love letter to us. He gives it to us so we can read it and we can prayerfully study and allow the, word, the Spirit of God to teach us and to mold us and help us to understand the truths of God and help us to live our life in a way that honors Him and pleases Him and brings glory to Him. And even with all that said, as God's people, it's still not possible for us to keep it fully and to be perfect. Amen? It's just not possible for us. But one day, one day, he'll make it right. It will be a glorious church as it talks about here. Look what it says. Again in verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Here's verse 27. That he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Let's talk about not only her preparation, but here's the second thing we said. What is God's desire for the bride of Christ? First of all, for her to be prepared, her preparation. The second thing is this, not only her preparation, but her presentation. Her presentation. Now in verse number 27 there, it says that he might present her to himself. Present there means to stand beside, to recommend or to, I, this, is my, this is my meaning, okay? This is what I said. To stand beside, to record, that's not my meaning. That's the meaning of the, of the concordance or the strongs in the words, in the Greek words. To stand beside, to recommend, and here's my meaning. To show her off. To show her off. So here's the thought here. Presentation means that Jesus is going to stand. He is not only, he is going to, to bring us to a point to where uh, he's going to stand beside us. He's going to put us on display before the Father. He's going to stand beside us uh, as, a, uh, as we're on exhibit, if you would. And he is presenting us uh, again. He wants us to be holy and without blemish and all these things. And finally at that day, at the wedding ceremony, we stand before God. And the bridegroom is there and the bride is there. And the ceremony is going to take place. Both are pure and holy and right. And that happens through preparation. But the presentation, he says, that he might present her to himself. That he might present her to himself. And then he says he might present her to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. A fixed position. That word glorious means a fixed position of honor, dignity, praise. Remember, he's going to stand beside us. You think Jesus is going to stand beside anything that's not pure and holy and right? He surely is not going to stand to make a commitment, a covenant that he has made to establish that, to, for that marriage to take place. He's not going to make that with a, an unfit bride. A glorious church. Unchanging, fixed in position with honor and dignity and praise to show us off. He says not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing never having the condition of being stained soiled defiled or wrinkled or anything like that 
Listen, God is not going to allow his son to, to wed or to marry a church that is not perfect, that is not without spot, that is not without wrinkle, that is not without stain. And you know what? We know the truth. Then we'll never make it, right? We'll never be able to stand before the Father. We'll never be able to be a part of the church. But remember the love of the bridegroom. Remember the sacrifice that he made for you and for me. Remember the blood that he shed. Remember the fact that it covered our sins and it washed us. God's desire for the bride of Christ is for her to be prepared, for her to be presented, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He says there she should be holy and without blemish. Pure is the thought, blameless, without fault, unblameable. In other words, listen, is the church perfect now? Can the world throw stones at the church today? Absolutely. Are, are we perfect? No. None of us are. And listen, there is no perfect church on this side of eternity. There's only a perfect Savior. And there's a bride that's supposed to be in preparation. That's allowing the Word of God to wash us as we teach it through Connect and as we teach it through preaching and all these things that we do, ministries that we do to teach the Word of God to help us to get on the right page and then the right position to where we're right before God and we're holy and pure as much as we can be on this side of eternity. He says a, she should be holy, blameless, and without blemish. In other words, somebody can't point a finger at, at the church and say, yeah, this is what you say, but this is who you are. This is what you say on Sunday, but this is what you do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and even Sunday afternoon, or even on the way to church on Sunday. Now that could never be the church, right? I'm afraid that's more of the church. At least that's what I see in the mirror sometimes when I look. Pure, blameless, without fault, unblameable. See, God's desire for the bride of Christ, for his son's bride, the church, is to be prepared. And also on that day in Revelation chapter 19 that we read about a few minutes ago. Turn back there. Revelation 19. On that day when the wedding ceremony takes place. Look at verse 7. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb, there's Jesus, has come and his wife, the church, the bride, has made herself ready. See, there's coming a day when the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, will be without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish, will stand holy and unblameable before God the Father alongside the Son, Jesus Christ. And there'll be a wedding in heaven. Verse 7 again, his wife has made herself ready. Jesus' bride, the church, has made her very own self fit and adjusted herself spiritually. The very meaning, I thought this interesting as you think about this. When we think about, uh, um, you know, a wedding on this earth, uh, everything is outward. Everything is what you see, right? Everything is all about uh, what's on, put on display and what, you know, the bride's, uh, her dress and the decorations and the beautiful cake and all the things, the, the dresses of the bride, of the, uh, you know, of those who walk down and all that kind of, and, and the, you know, the groomsmen and all this stuff. And, and it's all about what you see on the outside. What I'm telling you here is what's happening here and the meaning here is this. What, what makes the church pure is not about what's out on the outside, but it's what's happened on the inside. 
It's all about the inside. We won't ever get right by the way we look on the outside and what we do on the outside. What has to happen for us to get right, it starts from the inside. Jesus changes us from the inside out. That's what happens. If we don't give him what's on the inside, the outside will never change. His wife has made herself ready. She has made her very own self fit and adjusted herself spiritually. The very meaning is speaking of inward change, not speaking of adorning or, adre- or dressing oneself up, beautifying the outside for all to see. See, we can put on a show, right? And we do it good. We do it well. Sometimes we as God's people, we can put on a show. We can carry a big Bible under our arm. We can put our church clothes on and we can come down to Highland Baptist Church, get out of our car, walk in, come in and shake hands with everybody and hug necks with everybody and leave out here and go to the restaurant and all this kind of stuff and everything. And we look really churchy and all that kind of stuff. Can I just say this? That's not what we're talking about here, okay? We're talking about what happens on the inside. When Jesus literally changes us and washes us and cleanses us. See, what we're talking about for these last few weeks is this. We remember, if we're saved, we remember when all that happened, right? We remember when Jesus came in. Don't we? I mean, if we don't, we got, you know, we better come down here right now and get it right, okay? We remember when he saved us. We remember when he, when he uh, you know, he come inside of our lives. We remember when we repented. We remember when we felt that, that sense of peace that he gives us because we've given it to him and he's, you know, he's washed us and cleansed us. We remember that. Remember all those things. But the problem with most of us is this, is that we remember all that stuff and somehow we just let go of it. We, we, don't, we don't continue. See, the, the whole, it, we're in a preparation. Preparation means you're never over that. We never, even though Jesus changes us and he forgives us, he cleanses us, all those things. Listen, it's a process. It's called sanctification. Every day, it's a day, it's a day when we get up and we have to die to ourselves. Barry wants this. Barry wants that. Barry needs this. Barry has to have this. And God says, no, what you got to have is me. And this is what I want you to do. Yeah, but I want to do this. And at first, we listen to that. Then after a while, we decide to not listen to that anymore. And now I can get up and say, Barry's doing this today. Barry's doing this tomorrow. Hey, Barry's doing this the latter part of the week. And just like that runaway bride that we talk about, that movie, we've chosen to go our own path and to go our own way. And the bridegroom, Jesus, is still standing there right where he was from the beginning. And he's waiting on us. He's calling us to come back. He's saying, come on back. I'm still right here. I'm still right here. I still love you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what what you've been a part of. I want you to come back because I still love you just as much. This whole thought about all this comes from one little phrase. Return to me. Return to me. You know what the great thing about that word is, return? That means I've been there before. That means I've been there before. You see, I can return to God. I can return back to that relationship because I've been there before. And he just says, return to me. Return to me. God's desire for the bride, for me, as a part of the bride of Christ, for me, 
is for me to be in a time of preparation. A time where I'm allowing the word of God to wash me, to cleanse me, to guide me through the spirit of God as I live every day and surrender to Jesus. And then one day to know that there'll be a day of presentation when I will stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, stand alongside the bridegroom, and God wants us to stand perfect and holy, without blemish, without spot. Verse number 8 of chapter 19 says this, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints see for the bride in our society it's all about the gown it's all about the bride's what she's wearing here we see the bride's gown in verse number 8 look what it says and to her who's her? the church it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and clean and bright. Let's talk about that in just a minute and we're going to be done, okay? Jesus, hey, wrong, wrong page. Verse number seven, again, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. Here it is. Because of her preparation, talking about the church, remember she's made preparation. Because of her preparation, the church was given to be clothed in, it says, fine linen, clean and bright. Because of her preparation, the church was given to be clothed in a white, white, everybody say white, a white dress, perfectly pure, shining and radiant, magnificent in its appearance. I'm telling you on that day that the wedding takes place in heaven, the church is going to stand there. She's going to be shining and radiant, beautiful and magnificent for all to see. Not because of anything she's done, because of everything that Jesus has already done. It says here that the very uh, dress, if you would, the materials, it says fine linen. It means literally the, the meaning there is white, white linen, clean, pure, um, perfectly pure, shining and radiant, bright, it says, and clean, magnificent. It says for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So here's the deal. That phrase means this. Here is the reason the bride's dress is so magnificent, so shiny, so radiant. The very material that it's made from is the works, the deeds that were done by those who are true followers of Jesus. See, what happens before, and we talked about a few weeks ago, what happens before this wedding ceremony is something that's very important. It is the Bema seat of Christ or the judgment seat of Christ that takes place after the rapture of the church. When the church is called out, raptured up, remember we're going to fly to meet Jesus. Uh, those who are in the grave, they're going to be, uh, you know, they're going to be called up first. They're going, the grave's going to burst open. They're going to rise to meet Jesus in the air. You and I, if we're still on this earth, we're going to rise to meet Jesus after them. We're going to meet him in the air. And some, somehow, some way, somewhere, there's going to be a judgment seat or a Bema seat. And what happens at the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ is, is that Barry Freitas is going to stand before Jesus. And, and not to be judged for whether he's saved or lost, but to, be, to have his works that he has done in the body as a Christian uh, run through the fire. Did you do it for the right reasons? Did you do it so folks would pat you on the back? Did you do it because you love me? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and I, we don't have time to read that passage, but go there today, this, sometime this week, and look at that passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, it talks about the Bema seat or the judgment seat of Christ. And it, what it basically means is, you know what? For everything that I've done in the body for Je that I've said is for Jesus, it's going to be put on display. It's going to be run through the fire. And if it's 
gold and precious stones and all those things, it's going to last and it's going to even get more pure. But if it's wood, hay, and stubble, or if I've done it because I wanted you to pat me on the back or I want to get praise from man or whatever, it's going to burn up in the fire. And I'm telling you, these righteous, the, this, this clothing that's on this, that's on this uh, uh, bride's wedding dress, it comes from the very right and good and holy things that his people has done in the body for him. See, there's coming a day when there's going to be a wedding in heaven. And let me tell you something. It's going to be nothing like you've ever seen before. It's going to trump and over... It's going, listen, it's going to make the wedding of Prince Charles and Diana and, and all these other people that, we, that everybody watched from all over the world and thought, oh my goodness, that's so beautiful and so magnificent. It's going to make it just pale to nothing. God's desire for the church, for his son's bride is to get prepared and then one day in glory for there to be a great presentation when Jesus the son the bridegroom stands and down the aisle comes the bride and they join together before the Father, and the wedding takes place. That's what we got to be excited. That's what we got to look forward to. It's being a part of that. But the deal with that is this: it's that's that's exciting and all kind of good stuff. But listen, it's all about preparation. That's where we are. So what are we doing? What am I doing? What are we doing? And listen, we said, well, the church is you know what the church needs to do better. Yes, I agree with that. But you know what? You know who the church is? Me and you and all those who know the Lord. So listen, we don't get a cop out or we don't get an excuse or a pass because of this. We're a part of the church, so obviously we're part of the problem. We've got to change. We've got to get prepared. We've got to let God change us from the inside out continuously all the time. Serve him, live for him, love people. Tell them about the story of Jesus. Tell them about the good news. Tell them that there's life transformation. There is a life change that can happen in your life if you'll give yourself to Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice in the truth of your word. There is coming a day when we'll be a part of a wedding. And we'll be a part of a wedding not because of anything we've done, not anything good we've done or any of those things, but we'll be a part of a, uh, of a wedding because we'll be a part of the bride, the bride that is joined to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. He's going to come and fetch us and take us back to be with him, and then one day he's going to take us to our home that he's been preparing for us all this time. And we're going to spend forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever with him in glory. And God, we look forward to that, that day that's coming. God, I pray for this time of decision. And Lord, it's a time when we need to just allow you just to examine our hearts. To just, God, we're an open book to you anyway. You already know us. You know everything about us. And God, to know today that, Lord, that we all need to make improvements. We need to allow you to change us, continue changing us from the inside out. So, Lord, I pray that we'd be committed to your word. God, we commit it, be committed to studying and, and, and not only studying your word, but reading and praying and, and, and praying and asking you, God, to show us the truths of it. God, uh, being a part of a small group, God, maybe it's a Sunday school class or connect classes, Lord. Uh, maybe it's our Wednesday night time where we come together and we study small group stuff. And Lord, we just need to be a part of studying your word with a group of people, God, that we can be accountable to one another and we can encourage one another and help each other to grow in faith and love for you. So God, we pray for this time of decision. And God, we would recommit ourselves to the word of God to allowing your word, God, as we read it and as we uh, surrender to your spirit, Lord, and hear your spirit about it, God, just to wash us, to show us exactly who we are so that we might prepare for that day and we'll be a part of the 
of the body of Christ in glory. In Jesus' name, that all God's people said.